Okay, so a bit of, of an introduction. Uh, this is where I'm from. Uh, it's not actually the view from my house, but my house is a bit right. And so basically it's Tuscany, it's over there in the, in the central part of Italy. And as you can see, like, we have like uh, traditional types of cropping systems. We have uh, vineyards, we have olive trees. And I mean, most of these cropping systems, uh, not most of them, but some of them have, have been abandoned during the years. But there are still people who are managing them. And I'm one of them because uh, we have some olive trees down there. Um, this is where I studied. This is the Faculty of Agricultural Sciences in Florence. It's, um, I spent there three years. I mean, I, sp I, I was basically commuting, so I, I didn't actually live in Florence, but this is the faculty. And then at some point I said, okay, let's move to Sweden. So I chose a, a country <laughs> randomly on the map. And then I, I ended up in Stockholm for one year. I was working there for one year, uh, not in agricultural jobs at all. Uh, and then I actually got accepted for a master's uh, down at OLNEP, at SLU. I mean, OLNEP is one of the campuses of SLU uh, in the south of Sweden. Uh, there is actually a big castle that looks like Hogwarts, uh, <laughs> that one. And then, the, and then you have like student classes and uh, facilities and so on. It's a very nice place. It's a very nice place. So then during my master's, during my master program, uh, I went to Ecuador for three months. It was not three weeks, it's uh, anyway, three months. And basically I was here, this is Ecuador. And I was actually, I don't know if, no, this doesn't work, so I will, not, I will point with my finger. So I was basically working with potato farmers in this area, Ambato, Riobamba, those, those towns here. Uh, and I was working with the International Potato Center, which is part of the CGR consortium. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I was um, evaluating uh, an IPM uh, package in terms of uh, livelihoods sustainability. So it was, um, uh, it was a very yeah, social, social inquiry, I would say. But my background is, I mean, hard science. So what I studied in Florence is pretty much agronomy. But then I, I got tired of that, so I decided to jump on another boat. So, so this is what basically what I did there for three months. Uh, and then I ended up in Pisa, which is the place where I'm living now, uh, where I'm doing my PhD. I started there with a um, scholarship, so it was a, a, it was a grant for like, research for some months. And then I, I started a PhD, and now I'm at the end of my PhD, of my journey, long journey. Uh, so yeah, now I'm basically writing my thesis and, and I'm part of what I call the, soul, like, uh, the, the, the army of the dead. <laughs> For the ones of you who like Game of Thrones, it's like, it's like an army made of uh, third year uh, students, PhD students writing their thesis. And this is a picture of them. You can see them <laughs> sitting in, in that room sometimes. <laughs> So this is what I'm doing right now. Uh, so intercropping. Intercropping, here you have monoculture. Here you have intercropping, so one crop at the same time on the same surface. surface. And this is intercropping, which is two crops grown uh, simultaneously. I mean, uh, like intercropping can, be, can take very many different let's say, um, patterns. But in my case, the two crops are grown simultaneously. So together, in the same time, in the same space. And why would you do that? Because basically you have, I mean, from the literature you see that you have, um, you have many services 
uh, ranging from weed management, better weed management, soil fertility, pest suppression. You have also these services, uh, but I mean, what we are trying to do is actually uh, highlighting the services and trying to lower down the disservices. This is a picture of uh, close where I'm, I mean, this is actually where one of my farm trials are. So this is the picture that tourists like about Tuscany. I mean, hills, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, wheat fields, very smooth. But actually, this is not good. I mean, this is actually a picture of uh, deforestation and soil erosion. And, and this is actually a very, uh, uh, like a, a very problematic situation. Looking at looking at it from an environmental and agronomic perspective, this is a picture that I took uh, in one of my farm trials. You see that those cracks are like they can be like up to in my case they were like up to 30 centimeters deep, and but it, they can be you know even deeper you know so it's like just to give you an idea of what type of environment you have there. I mean, you have uh, serious environmental problems and also serious problems about soil fertility. So the question is, how do we, I mean, restore soil fertility in the long term while at the same time uh, uh, using intercropping as a short term um, benefit for farmers? What do they gain from it? So. This is the research hypothesis of my thesis, is that I have two crops. So I have clover here, and then I have common wheat, uh, bread wheat, because we also grow pasta wheat, durum wheat, back home. But this is common wheat. So you have above ground and below ground interactions between the two, between the two crops. And this is the first phase. So this is the phase where both crops grow, coexist, so they grow together. And then you have a second phase where at some point you have a, you have a tractor. No, you don't have a tractor, maybe, because the video doesn't work. <laughs> no tractor. No, quick time not available. So you you won't see any tractor this time. Okay, so basically I can I can mime it, mimic it. Like okay, there is a tractor here, and it's basically incorporating the clover into the soil. It's a shame that you cannot see it because it's very it's very easy to to understand what type of system. I'm talking about. So basically you have a tractor and it's passing through the wheat rows and it's incorporating by means of a rotary hole, it's incorporating the clover into the soil. And why, 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 why doing that? It's because uh, supposedly you would have a wheat reduction, I mean a reduction in terms of wheat biomass and uh, density and you would have at that point soil, I mean, uh, nitrogen, soil nitrogen available for the, for the main crop, which is in, a, in our case was wheat. So we want to harvest the wheat. And we are using the clover as a companion plant, as an as a, um, auxiliary plant. So this is the hypothesis. This is the researcher's uh, hypothesis. But then a question arises, which is, okay, this is the system we want to, we would like to implement for a number of reasons. So how do we, how do we jump from the current farming systems, which you can find in Italy, I mean, monocultures of wheat everywhere, to this system of intercropping? So it came to my mind a picture that I, I when I, I was studying in Sweden, uh, I used to like it a lot, which was this picture. I mean, some of you will see, maybe some of you have seen it already. 
Some of you will see an old lady, some of you will see a young lady. So basically, this, this to explain that, you know, sometimes you have issues, like for example, sustainability, which is a very uh, contested term. So you have the same word, but you have many different word views about that word. And in order to come up with a, um, with a common understanding of what we're talking about, I'm using participatory research. Because participatory research is basically about um, like letting many stakeholders, different stakeholders, participate in, for example, the research process I'm carrying out and creating like um, a common framework of understanding. Basically, this is what I, I intended for participatory research. And then I'm also using, I've used some systems, uh, some systems methodologies. Uh, why? Because I wanted to avoid the, the classical problem of agronomists, which is you enter the system through this point, so you touch the elephant here and you think it's a wall, you know. But actually, if you, you know, if you enter the system from this point, you see, oh no, this elephant is a tree. And un unless you have a systems view of your, for example, mm, farming system or cropping system, you will never uh, reach a, a satisfactory picture of what you're studying. Which doesn't mean that you study everything. I mean, it means that you're doing a very critical analysis of boundaries. So it's about basically understanding uh, where the boundaries are and where you can actually have the entry points of your system. This is basically why I'm using systems methodologies. So. Big, big and long introduction. What I did, the first thing I did was interviewing 10 experts, okay? what we call experts, uh, because I wanted to have an idea of best practices that they regard as best practices about weed management and soil fertility. Uh, so I, I had these 10 interviews with 10 experts and they gave me many answers about what they regarded as best practices. And then I interviewed 10 farmers and I asked them many, many, very many things about um, how they're managing the weeds and how they're managing their soil fertility rotations and information, how they acquire information and markets and so on. And then I asked them, uh, would you implement the best practices proposed by the researchers? And then they had three answers, but I will come to that later. So what I, uh, what I found out relate, relating to these five topics is that. So the farmers I interviewed in the areas, they are applying very short rotations, which, I mean, which means that they, they are having problems with diseases and pests, but then they are very, I mean, most of them are yeah, the majority of them are conventional farmers. So they apply uh, increasingly um, bigger amounts of chemical inputs for that. There is a high pressure on weeds. So many are experiencing uh, severe weed resistance. Um, it was very new for me because I was just you know, I just came back from Sweden, so for me everything was very new, so I, I googled it and I found that actually in the same, exactly in the same area, there is, uh, they have found um, uh, the first lolium biota, which, is, which has a cross resistance to glyphosate and those two guys, I mean ACC and LS, uh, ALS, I mean I'm not very expert on this stuff, but I mean, it struck me that, you know, actually in the place, probably one, I mean, some of the farmers that I interviewed were the farmers where those lolium plants were actually taken. So high pressure on weeds, very high pressure. And then they are not applying any manure. 
no organic matter applied whatsoever, only synthetic fertilizers. There is not a public uh, extension service. I mean, they, I mean, they don't receive uh, advices from public advisors. I mean, there are only private ones. Yeah. They are experiencing very low and fluctuating prices for wheat, uh, for wheat grain, which is probably something that is happening here as well. Um, and there are no social platforms for farmers. So, I mean, the only social platform that I found is a, is a website about tractors. Because they like tractors very much. So, <laughs> yeah. So basically, <laughs> I found this website, this uh, forum online, it's called Tractorum. And it's like there is one guy, one of the guys I interviewed, which is the, you know, the web um, master of the website. And he's like managing, he knows everything about tractors and, you know, machineries. But there are no, you know, farmer, um, you know, farmer to farmer social networks, you know, like. Is that specifically in Italian or? Is what? There, in South Africa, all the guys are on the US <laughs> forums. Around there? In South Africa, all the farmers are on the US farmers forums. But ah. obviously not on Italian. No, so no, no, yeah. no, no. No, because they don't know English. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there is a language barrier that actually, yeah. yeah. No. no, they need Italian websites. Okay, this is the result of this question. Would you implement the best practices? So, these are 11 best practices. So I asked them. Uh, I gave them actually three cards. One was green, one was yellow, and one was red. Um, red, okay. Green is yes. I'm already implementing this this uh, practice. Uh, yellow was uh, no. I'm not. I'm not doing it. But I would do it. And three, which is red, I'm not doing it, and I wouldn't do it. Or I think it's not feasible. Or I think it's um, it's uh, not relevant for me. Okay, so there are many, I mean, what's most important here is intercropping. I mean, there is very, uh, something very important about weed scouting. So nobody actually was willing and or thought that could be um, relevant for them to, to go on the field and do weed scouting, you know, like, say again? Identify. Identifying okay. the, the, the plants which was very interesting for me. I mean, they, they have a really, you know, high pressure on, like, on weeds. They have many problems about weeds. And actually, they, they, they thought it was not relevant for them to actually go and analyze and identify weed species. Mm -hmm. Because they thought, actually, they knew the, <laughs> <laughs> they knew the species. So, yeah. Anyway, intercropping was a, I mean, most of them didn't know about intercropping, so I had to explain them what intercropping was. And then they, um, when I explained them what intercropping was, they thought about relay cropping, which is basically another type of intercropping where you uh, sow the legume species when the cereal is already on the field. So that's, that's relay cropping because actually their, their grandparents used to do, the, used to used to do it. But anyway, it didn't raise so much, so much attention. I mean, there was only one farmer who was, um, who was uh, already, doing the, already doing it. It's because he's, um, he's, um, he's a farmer with livestock. So he's uh, also a shepherd. And he's like using like mixed cropping for uh, like, you know, as a, um, as a, um, Fodder, yeah, as fodder. Okay. This was my entry point. So I had to understand what was the context around my, you know, my research. So those were the, the first 20 interviews that I performed. And then I wanted to set up farm trials because I wanted to have a, I mean, intercropping has been 
studied thoroughly in experimental sites. But it's hard to go, I mean, it's harder to go to the field and try it with, with you know, wheeling farmers, you know. So I wanted to take the, the opportunity and the challenge to do it. Um, so I organized the first kickoff meeting. Uh, for the ones who, who of, you, of you who are, this is like an um, action research cycle which is made up of uh, four steps, usually. Uh, and those are the four steps. So a first kickoff meeting, the first field day with the farmers, and then a second field day with the farmers. And in between, a lot of samplings, like, but really a lot. And samplings, like hard samplings. So I, with my colleagues, went to the field, and then we sampled weeds biomass like you know uh, like uh, uh, yeah agronomy type of samplings so the first kickoff meeting so this one with eight participants so we organized this meeting and we want i mean we started from scratch so we had to i mean we also had to set up the factors to test you know to the treatments everything so there, there were many, many options at stake. I mean, we could, we could try whatever we wanted. So we could try like clover species. So we could try like the same wheat variety, but with different clover species. The same clover, but with different wheat varieties. Then we could try, okay, we could try incorporating the clover versus not incorporating the clover. That was another option. And then we could also try, I mean, one of the suggestions from the farmer was trying an intercropping system, but with different fertilizer rates and with different fertilizer, um, different types of fertilizers. And then, I mean, I let them decide, you know? I mean, I let them decide what they wanted to do. And these are the results. So basically, clover species uh, uh, scored better compared to wheat variety, clover incorporation, and fertilization. So basically, the, the answer was, let's try different clover species with the same wheat variety. Th so this is what we do, we did. Just to make it short, I won't present all the results about the other clover species. So I will just present one. There is a reason for it. I mean, uh, it's because the second year of trial, we tried only this one. So I'm going to present the results only on that species. So basically, we had three treatments, an intercropping system, uh, wheat and clover, uh, sown 75% of the dose, of the recommended dose, and then not fertilized. Then we had a control because the guys, the guys said, okay, I, told, I mean, we told them, okay, we can, we can compare this stuff with this stuff, you know? So like a typical agronomical comparison, you know? And then they were like, okay, but why? I mean, is it of any importance for us to compare this with this? I mean, we will never grow wheat this way. I mean... Never. So that's why we added a, con a real farming control treatment. And this is like wheat um, as normally sown by organic farmers. So it's like sole wheat, I mean, wheat as a sole crop. Uh, sorry, it's not half dose, it's full dose. Full dose, so it's 400 seeds per square meter and orga organically fertilized with. Uh, 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, which is still very low compared to conventional standards. But it's something that, I mean, more or less, it w it's, it's a, yeah, I think organic farmers in Italy are actually doing it. I mean, 50 kilo, kilos of nitrogen per hectare is the average. So th those were the three treatments. And now I'm going to present you some hard data on, you know, on, on biomass and nitrogen. 
So the first phase, so at this point, the two species are together. They have grown together. So this is our intercropping system. This is the ecological uh, researcher control. And this is the farming control. Two locations. We have analyzed it together because there was no interaction with, with, with the site. Um, so actually, the, like, as you can see, there was no significant difference between the, uh, the intercropping system and the, the ecological control, even though, I mean, you can see a clear, I mean, there is a difference in biomass between the two, between the two treatments. I mean, we couldn't detect it, detect it uh, statistically, but in my opinion, there was a difference. So it means that there, there had been some competition between the two crops. I mean, if this biomass, which is wheat biomass, is lower than this one, it means that in some way there must have been some type of competition between the two crops. Uh, what type of competition? I mean, that's the question. Uh, what I... Um, okay, I will come to that later. Okay, then we looked also at, uh, okay, so the red one is wheat biomass. Then we looked at weed biomass, and actually it seemed like the intercropping system was actually favoring weed biomass. And this is something that has been seen already. I mean, sometimes, especially legume companion plants, they can actually foster <coughs> weed growth in intercropping systems. Um, but it was not the same the case in, in the other location, in the other site. I think that, yeah, I, I think that the results on weed biomass are a bit controversial. Uh, probably the reason why this one is lower than this one here, it's because probably like it was a combined effect of the cl a clo uh, like a good clover biomass and a w a, uh, and the wheat crop. So I haven't told you that in this case, uh, like 90% of the wheat biomass was lolium, ryegrass, which is a species that is like overlapping with, like, with wheat, you know. In this case, the wheat biomass was, yeah, around 90% of uh, wild mustard. So it's like uh, synapis advances, which is not that much overlapping with neither of the crops. Okay, but anyway, let's go on. Uh, then I looked at nitrogen concentration because nitrogen is actually one of the most limiting factors for wheat growth. So I wanted to see the concentration of nitrogen in the biomass. Again, the red bars are wheat. So we actually saw that there was an increase in nitrogen concentration uh, in the intercropping system, which is significant compared to the farming, uh, to the um, ecological control in this site, but it was not significant in this site, in this location, even though there was a, I mean, there was an increase. Um, what, does, what does this tell us? It basically tells us that, I mean, either there has been a direct transfer of nitrogen from the clover crop to the wheat crop, or there has been some, like, an increase in nitrogen available in the soil because the clover crop is able to fix in nitrogen from the atmosphere, you know? So if that crop is fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere, that it means that the, the, like the soil pool of nitrogen is more available for the wheat crop. You know? You follow me? So anyway, I mean, this is what we, we, we saw. I mean, there was an increase significant in one side and not significant in the other for nitrogen concentration. And this was the first phase, coexistence. Okay, and then weed, blah, blah, blah. This is the second phase. So now we are at harvest. 
So now we are after the clover has been incorporated into the soil. So again, uh, you see red is straw, green is grain wheat, and blue is weed biomass. Okay. So as you can see here, there is no difference at all. So the, the intercropping system and the, the ecological <coughs> agronomic uh, control treatment are exactly the same here. So it must, I mean, it, it means that actually, you see this gap during the first phase? It was, I mean, almost completely filled, you know, during the spring. So actually, the fact that the clover was not there anymore because it was in the soil at that point must have helped the main crop somehow I mean either by adding nitrogen into the soil or by limiting competition in some some way it must have helped it but there was still a gap between the farming the farming control and this gap was around 20 percent Okay, this was straw, this was wheat, uh, this was grain, I mean, which is basically the same. Uh, this was uh, weed, I mean, we couldn't detect any difference. And then nitrogen concentration, again, we saw an increase in nitrogen, nitrogen concentration for the intercropping system. Blah, blah, blah. And then protein, which is actually uh, a, I mean, for farmers, it's a very important par parameter. Uh, the amount of protein that you, you find in the grain. Uh, the overall results were, um, from a farmer's perspective, uh, disappointing, I would say, because it's like, I mean, a protein content that is below 10% is, uh, is not good. I mean, it's something that... Uh, okay, in, in this site, we have had a very serious ryegrass infest uh, infestation. Yeah. So this, this is probably the reason why we are having this, this, this result. I mean, here it was more promising. And it was actually, it was interesting for the farmer, you know. And actually the fact that, you know, the, the intercropping system here was the only one that, you know, went above this, this line. I mean, and it was always significantly higher than both, I mean, both the other control treatments. I mean... Uh, okay, so in the meantime, <laughs> while I was taking these uh, samples and going to the field and collecting this type of data, we also went to the field with the farmers. Okay, we went to the field because part of my participatory action research project was to actually let them participate. No. So instead of you know <laughs> teaching them how to use R, I I thought that it could be it could be more useful to bring them to the field and actually let them evaluate each single plot. Like you know the work of um, you know participatory breeding done by Ceccarelli. It's like it's basically doing the same thing. It's like Letting the you know the farmers decide what's best. So, I brought them to the field and then I told them, okay, this is the experimental field. You can walk through it. You have a number on each plot, and you can decide uh, if you like it or not. <coughs> and you can write it. So from one, which was very very bad, to five, which was very very good. Uh, and these are the results. So don't look at this. Uh, so five, four are positive answers. Okay. One thing first. These results are about this site. Okay. So the pro the promising site. So. Apparently, okay, first of all, they liked it a lot. 
and actually it was confirmed by the fact that I mean the total yield in the field was actually uh, it's actually above the average for that farm which is some, it's something that rarely happens in you know agronomical fields you know I mean researchers field because usually we mess up with everything so so it usually <laughs> yields way less than the farmer would, would actually yield but in that case it was it was positive I mean uh, lucky I mean just by chance because actually the other side was a mess uh, anyway they liked it a lot as you can see like most of the answers were positive and then I tried to make some statistics on it using non-parametric statistics and I couldn't find any any difference between the uh, you know among the treatments uh, they liked the intercropping system uh, slightly less you know than than the other two I mean I put the the hard data here to show you that you know uh, like the control the farming control was actually the one yielding the most but apparently I mean there was no detection of this difference for them I mean probably uh, what they evaluated was uh, like um, the result on a per plant basis you know this is probably what, I, what they did it's like um, they lacked the plants so they gave a score depending on, on a per plant basis not on a plot basis because if I had told them you know uh, score it on a per plot basis then they would they would have probably noticed that the control this one you know would have yielded much more than the, than the other two you know I don't know if you follow me anyway so this was about wheat wheat bias and this is this was this was about weed so actually I asked them the same question so you go on the field you <coughs> evaluate the wheat and then you evaluate the weed biomass present so if you like that plot or not in terms of weed weed biomass so they went on the field and apparently they liked the most the control strip so the ecological researcher control treatment then the control farming control and then the intercropping system so the intercropping system was the one with the you know with most negative answers then I looked at the data and then I said well actually it's true I mean it's exactly what happened I mean it's like the control strip is the one with less weeds and then you have the control treatment and then you have the intercropping system okay uh, I mean uh, Okay, this difference was not significant. I tried my best to, <laughs> to find some significance in that, in that analysis, but I couldn't. But I mean, just to show you the trend, you know, I think that we are too much into the p-value sometimes, but just the trend, you know, just the trend of, you know, weed biomass. So, I mean, this was just to show you that, you know, like the usual reason why um, farmers are not involved into the research process is because you know they don't understand I mean come on I mean I mean it's easier for them to just drive a tractor you know but actually I mean I mean this proves that there is a I mean if you apply the, the right methods the right methodologies I mean there must be some knowledge still I mean visual I mean it's probably not written knowledge but it's some type of some other type of knowledge in like in the farmer community and there must be a learning process in what we're doing I mean they must have learned something from from this this was just to counteract the usual you know the usual answer when I when I tell people what I'm doing you know so and more, mm, moreover, I mean, on top of this, they were able to actually uh, propose technical solutions because 
Um, so basically the fact was that uh, there was a, a technical issue with the clover and how to incorporate it into the ground and um, he said yeah we should find a way to incorporate all the clover into the ground otherwise if we leave I mean um, the clover is very productive in terms of biomass during the spring so if you leave one plant it's going to grow like a you know like a tree and then another thing he said was like why don't we sow 10 days in advance because he actually realized that we saw if we sow 10 days in advance there will be more I mean nitrogen fixation more nitrogen available for the main crop I mean I found that there were I mean there were you know insights from the farmers point of view in terms of technical solutions and also about lines for future research so um, this guy here, I mean, he is one of the guys who, one of the farmers involved in the, in the trials. You know, we should find a clover, he said, we should find a clover uh, that, that flowers, you know, mm, that flowers um, uh, early, you know. Because the fact is that, like, the nitrogen fixation the highest rate of fixation happens when you have the, the plant flowering so actually since we are incorporating the clover into the soil when it's not i mean before the flower stage it means that the amount of nitrogen we are incorporating is less than the, the you know the top you know and he said yeah we i mean this is like a like a, an idea for breeding you know, breeding varieties for intercropping, you know, like breeding varieties that flower earlier, you know, for, spe you know, for special intercropping techniques. I think this struck me. Yeah, it should flower in March so as to provide all the nitrogen necessary for the wheat crop. And then they were very willing to participate. Uh, like, uh, he is the other farmer, he said that. They, they are never, never involved in this type of activities, never. And actually, for example, it, it's, mm, it's very important for them about varieties, you know. Because what they do about varieties is that they buy the new variety that the guy is selling them. And they, they don't know how it has been bred, for, in which conditions, for, I mean, for which type of environment. And this guy was like, yeah, I mean, this type of participatory work is actually good because we know where, I mean, where the innovation comes from. I mean, we are also the, you know, the ones who are um, promoting innovation, you know. And then um, another concept that I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to uh, analyze properly in my thesis is like adaptive management. Um, uh, you will understand the reason why I'm talking about adaptive management just in one second. Uh, so this guy said, um, so he, he was just explaining something to me and then he was talking about a, a millet crop that uh, was very good at withstanding, uh, we have had a very serious uh, drought, like a dry period last year in Italy. <laughs> and actually, the, the, like the surroundings were yellow, and like a like a desert of you know nothing. And then there was this field of millet. It was the only one green, so he was actually able to 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 see it. And like he was like, yeah, we should uh, we should we'll probably turn into millet production in the future because it's actually um like. I'm able to manage, you know, changing conditions, you know. First example. Second example, like this guy said, you know, I had to harrow my land twice because glyphosate didn't work at all. So actually this guy is like a very, I mean, he's one of the guys involved in the trial. It's like very conventional, like, you know, uh, glyphosate twice, and then you have other herbicides twice or three times and then you have four applications of nitrogen fertilizers bang you know like very input driven farming 
but at some point he realized that this glyphosate doesn't work anymore, you know? So he actually had to apply glyphosate twice. No, first time. And the ryegrass didn't, I mean, didn't die at all. It was like, you know, yeah, it, he, he was a bit shocked and then he, you know, he grew again. Uh, so he applied glyphosate again, you know, the second time. Increase the selection pressure. <laughs> Bam, like this, and nothing worked. Okay. So at some point he said, "Okay, I have to come back to you know my previous type of uh, yeah, like practices." So he yeah he basically harrowed the the the, the field, the field, the fields because he he's like cultivating five hundred hectares. Uh, and then he prepared the, um, the soil bed. So like four times, I mean. Anyway, just to <coughs> just to give you another example of what I what I mean for adaptive management is like managing your farming system in a very changing uh, and risky situation in the sense that uh, basically you. From one day to another, you have to change uh, farming attitude and farming activity depending on the, the external conditions. You know? And this is something that I, I, um, I mean, we apply it every day too. But in a very, I think that farming is a very, very risky and changing environment because you are dealing with the weather, the environment, you are dealing with life, you know? And life is not predictable at all even though we are trying to predict it. Uh, so it's like managing, uh, ch changing conditions and adapting to, to them, basically. This is what I mean. Do I have time? Go ahead. Yeah? yeah? How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> but how much time? Oh. Okay. No, I think money is important because when you talk to farmers, it's like, okay, everything is nice, you're very funny and whatever, you know, how much money do I make, you know? So it's like, so this is the result of our last focus group. And um, can you see it? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is like intercropping. Okay, I've tried to create uh, an economic, like, it's a very, 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 very simple economic analysis. I'm sorry, I mean, it's not very complicated, but it, it was just a result of, um, like, very simple calculations that farmers make on an everyday basis. I mean, this is the result of basically like semi-structured interviews. I mean, it was more like a focus group with the farmers with the two farmers involved in the, in the trial. We have tried, we, we tr I mean, I tried to adapt this economic analysis on one of the farms. Uh, so uh, one of the farms is organic, is turning into organic production. So next year they will sell organic products. So this is the intercropping system. This is the <coughs> control type of system. So the one you have seen, with a, with a, so I suppose a 20% decrease in yield in this intercropping system and an increase of 1.5 protein content. Okay, uh, sorry it's in Italian. Anyway, like what I, want, what I want you to see is that there was only just about 50 euros per hectare difference between the intercropping system and the normal customary way of growing wheat in an organic farm. Yeah, 50 euros on, on a per hectare base, which is not too much. I mean, considering that you are, I mean, you're not only using a different system, you are sowing for the future. I mean, Let's say you, up, you use intercropping every year, you are incorporating organic matter in the soil every year. I mean, it means that 
You remember those problems about cracks and soil fertility and erosion and so on? You are trying to avoid them in the medium long term. This is what you're doing with intercropping. It's not only another type of wheat uh, growth. I mean, uh, I, I also suppose like an increased price for, uh, because act uh, actually currently in Italy there is a premium price for uh, higher protein content in conventional farming. So I uh, don't remember the exact numbers, but it's like if your wheat grain has more protein than the other, I mean, you have a premium price. There should be one in organic farming too, but there is not. <coughs> I mean, as a matter of fact, there is not. Because basically the, like the, the production of Italian organic wheat is so low that actually whatever it's in there, they take it, you know? So it's like, um, I mean, I mean, the demand is so high and the, the, the offer is so low that actually even if your wheat has a 10% protein content, they take it anyway. I mean, according to farmers' interviews, I mean, farmers and experts' interviews. Okay, so, I mean, there was a difference in, uh, but it was not such a big difference to me. I mean, 50 euros per, on a per hectare base, I mean, what, what, what is the price you used to? I can't see that. The organic price? This is the organic price paid to the farmer. Just say the number. I just wanted to say. What does it say? 50 what? euros per 100 kilos. 500 euros per ton. Per ton, yeah. Which is what they are paid nowadays for organic wheat, organic uh, wheat grain. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they are paid between 45 and 50 euros, uh, so 450 and 500 euros per ton. Yeah, but I su so I basically I apply the difference because, because I suppose that the intercropping system would have a, an increase in protein, you know? So an increase in protein supposedly means an increase in price. I mean, this is all like suppositions, you know? But in case, the, in case there is an increase in price, there would be a difference of only 50 euros per hectare. Considering that the intercropping system is yielding 20% less. You know? And is that your inputs cost more for the conventional system? Mm, yeah, this one. Because actually the, the manure we applied is very, very expensive. I mean, we applied organic manure, poultry, poultry? Yeah, poultry manure which is very expensive. I mean, very expensive. I mean, it's, uh, it's more expensive than nitrogen fertilizer. Mm. Uh, okay, just, okay, I don't want to, it's, it's, I'm almost done. So basically, conclusions on the hard, hard data. We have a 20% decrease in yield in the intercropping system compared to the farming control. Then we have an increase of 1.5% of protein, which could be uh, paid to farmers on an on a imaginary word. Then we haven't had a clear indication on wheat biomass. So I think that, uh, and if you look at the literature, it's all the same. <coughs> I mean, it's like, I mean, especially legume companion plants, they can actually foster wheat. Sometimes they can, depending on the biomass they produce, they can actually decrease it. I think it's a very tricky universe. Uh, and around 50 euros per hectare loss in revenues, if you, I mean, if you, in this imaginary world, if you apply into cropping. And then, adding complexity. Is it always good? Which is actually what we talked about in the car when we were driving back from the workshop. Ad I will go back to the adaptive management concept, okay? So, you uh, are managing your farm with a, in a very changing and risky condition, environment, okay? So, one day, one guy like me comes to the farm and, you know, and tells you, 
you know, you should do intercropping because in the long term you will add uh, uh, organic matter to the soil, it's gonna prevent some problems. And it's like, okay, it's fine, I understand it, but in this type of management, I mean, am I actually adding risk in the short term? I mean, the fact that there are many technical problems right now in intercropping, machineries, uh, sowing densities, and so on. I mean, why would I, why would I do that? I mean, why would I, because, you know, complexity is usually um, with, like, linked to uh, increased resilience and so on, which I agree, I mean, it is. But, I mean, in which time perspective? And, and which time perspective do farmers apply when they farm, you know? This is probably another research question that I won't be able to, to answer. But anyway, I think that there is an issue here. I mean, there is an issue between adding complexity and risk management. Um, so, there is no premium price for Italian organic common wheat. So, what, I, what I've told you so far is completely <laughs> useless. Because actually, I mean, I mean, until up to the point where there is actually some type of, I mean, market or you know, institutional change, I mean, probably like the fact that the intercropping system increases protein doesn't really matter to farmers. So uh, there is a lack of public ex extension service, and this, uh, yeah, I haven't told you about third loop learning, but it's like, it's like oh, it, it, mm, this point is actually a big obstacle to like uh, groundbreaking changes, you know? So it's like, okay, they can change fertilizer, they can change machinery, but if you want to have like uh, proper, you know, groundbreaking innovations, like for example, changing from uh, normal wheat growing to intercropping, you need like, mm, free of interest uh, uh, advisors, you know? Because right now, I mean, th there are many advisors, but they are paid by private companies in my, in my own country and probably elsewhere. Um, so fragile financial situation doesn't help for risky management. So, I mean, if you, I mean, I mean, I mean the meaning is that, I mean, if you, if you are in a very fra fragile financial situation, like most of them are, I mean, doesn't really help for this type of uh, risky systems. Um, yeah, there are no like uh, farmer to farmer schools, so there, there is not a real exchange of innovative ideas apart from tractors and machineries. But I think that there is a there is a, a potential for this type of innovation because weed management. Uh, I think in the Western world is at a crossroad because I think that we are at a point where resistance, I mean, is actually uh, uh, like hindering the, an everyday like farming activity. So it's like uh, either we found a completely different way of managing our weeds on the field or we perish. So, okay, this is my, yeah? Yeah, this was just, um, yeah, so, so it's basically, I wanted to figure out how to, 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 uh, to explain change. And in my opinion, it's like made of like information, like if you have the right type of information, I mean, that comes to you. And then you have learning because you have to have a, a sort of like learning process to like to, uh, to make all this information yours. Mm. And then in order to have change, you have to have a social, political, economic environment that is actually fostering or slowing down, slowing down this, uh, this process. So yeah, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>